surveying or land surveying is the technique, profession, and science of accurately determining the terrestrial or three-dimensional position of points and the distances and angles between them, commonly practiced by licensed surveyors, and members of various building professions. These points are usually on the surface of the earth, and they are often used to establish land maps and boundaries for ownership, locations or other governmentally required or civil law purposes. To accomplish their objective, surveyors use elements of mathematics, physics, engineering and law. An alternative definition, from the American Congress on Surveying and Mapping, is the science and art of making all essential measurements to determine the relative position of points or physical and cultural details above, on, or beneath the surface of the earth, and to depict them in a usable form, or to establish the position of points or details. Furthermore, as alluded to above, a particular type of surveying known as land surveying is the detailed study or inspection, as by gathering information through observations, measurements in the field, questionnaires, or research of legal instruments, and data analysis in the support of planning, designing, and establishing of property boundaries. It involves the re-establishment of cadastral surveys and land boundaries based on documents of record and historical evidence, as well as certifying surveys of subdivision plats or maps, registered land surveys, judicial surveys, and space delineation. Land surveying can include associated services such as mapping and related data accumulation, construction layout surveys, precision measurements of length, angle, elevation, area, and volume, as well as horizontal and vertical control surveys, and the analysis and utilization of land survey data. Surveyors use various tools to do their work successfully and accurately, such as total stations, robotic total stations, GPS receivers, prisms, 3D scanners, radio communicators, handheld tablets, digital levels, and surveying software. Surveying has been an essential element in the development of the human environment since the beginning of recorded history. It is required in the planning and execution of nearly every form of construction. Its most familiar modern uses are in the fields of transport, building and construction, communications, mapping, and the definition of legal boundaries for land ownership. History Basic surveillance has occurred since humans built the first large structures. The prehistoric monument at Stonehenge was set up by prehistoric surveyors using peg and rope geometry. In ancient Egypt, when in the Nile River overflowed its banks and washed out farm boundaries, boundaries were re-established by a rope stretcher, or surveyor, through the application of simple geometry. The nearly perfect squareness and north-south orientation of the Great Pyramid of Giza, built c. 2700 BC, affirmed the Egyptians' command of surveying. The Gromis surveying instrument originated in Mesopotamia. Under the Romans, land surveyors were established as a profession, and they established the basic measurements under which the Roman Empire was divided, such as a tax register of conquered lands. In England, the Doomsday Book commissioned by William the Conqueror in 1086 recorded the names of all the landowners, the area of land they owned, the quality of the land, and specific information of the area's content and inhabitants, although it did not include maps showing exact locations. Modern surveying, Gunter's chain was introduced in 1620 by English mathematician Edmund Gunter, which enabled plots of land to be accurately surveyed and plotted for legal and commercial purposes. In the 18th century, modern techniques and instruments for surveying began to be used. The modern theodolite, a precision instrument for measuring angles in the horizontal and vertical planes, was introduced by Jesse Ramsden in 1787. He created his great theodolite using a very accurate dividing engine of his own design. Earlier, more primitive devices, had been invented by Leonard Diggers, Joshua Habermal and Jonathan Sisson in the previous centuries but Ramsden's theodolite represented a great step forward in the instrument's accuracy. William Gascoigne invented an instrument that used a telescope with an installed crosshair as a target device, in 1640. James Watt developed an optical meter for the measuring of distance in 1771. It measured the parallactic angle from which the distance to a point could be deduced. The modern systematic use of triangulation was introduced by the Dutch mathematician Wilbert Snell, 
who in 1615 surveyed the distance from Eichmauer to Bergen op Zoom, approximately 70 miles, using a chain of quadrangles containing 33 triangles in all. Snell calculated how the planar formulae could be corrected to allow for the curvature of the Earth. He also showed how to resection, or calculate, the position of a point inside a triangle using the angles cast between the vertices at the unknown point. These could be measured much more accurately than bearings at the vertices, which depended on a compass. This established the key idea of surveying a large-scale primary network of control points first, and then locating secondary subsidiary points later, within that primary network. Between 1733 and 1740 Jacques Cassini and his son car copyright Tsar Cassini undertook the first triangulation of France, including a re-surveying of the Meridian Arc, leading to the publication in 1745 of the first map of France constructed on rigorous principles. Triangulation methods were by now well established for local map making, but it was only towards the end of the 18th century that detailed triangulation network surveys were established to map whole countries. A team from the Ordnance Survey of Great Britain, originally under General William Roy began the principal triangulation of Britain using the specially built Ramsden Theodolite in 1783. This survey was finally completed in 1853. The Great Trigonometric Survey of India, which ultimately named and mapped Mount Everest and the other Himalayan peaks, was begun in 1801. The Indian survey had an enormous scientific impact. It was responsible for one of the first accurate measurements of a section of an arc of longitude, and for measurements of the geodesic anomaly. Surveying became a professional occupation in high demand at the turn of the 19th century with the onset of the Industrial Revolution. Surveyors were used on industrial infrastructure projects, such as canals, roads and rail, and the profession developed increasingly accurate instruments to aid its work. Napoleon Bonaparte founded Continental Europe's first cadaster in 1808. This gathered data on the number of parcels of land, their value, land usage and names. This system soon spread around Europe. Because of the fundamental value of land and real estate to the economy, Land surveying was one of the first professions to require professional licensure. In many jurisdictions, the land surveyor's license was the first professional licensure issued by the state, province, or government. 20th century, at the beginning of the century surveyors still faced the problem of measuring long distances accurately, despite improvements over the older measuring chains and ropes. During the 1950s, the telerometer developed by Dr. Trevor Lloyd Wadley was developed to measure long distances using two microwave transmitter receivers. During the late 1950s Geodimeter introduced electronic distance measurement equipment, EDM, using the principles of measuring the phase shift of light waves that are still used by modern instruments. These instruments were able to measure between points many kilometers apart in one go, sometimes saving the need for days or weeks of chain measurements. Advances in electronics allowed miniaturization of EDM and in the 1970s the first instruments combining angle and distance measurement were produced, becoming known as total stations. Gradually manufacturers added more equipment such as tilt compensators, data recorders, and onboard calculation programs, bringing improvements in accuracy, and speed of measurement. The first satellite positioning system was the U.S. Navy Transit System. The first successful launch took place in 1960. The system's primary purpose was to provide position information to Polaris missile submarines, but it could also be used by surveyors with field receivers to determine the location of a point. The small number of satellites and bulky equipment made observations slow, difficult and inaccurate, so usage of the system was limited to establishing benchmarks in remote locations. The first prototype satellites of the Global Positioning System were launched in 1978. Initially another military system, GPS used a larger constellation of satellites and improved signal transmission to allow more accuracy. Early GPS observations required the receiver to be fixed in a static position for several hours to collect enough observations to reach survey accuracy requirements. 
recent improvements to both the satellites and the receivers allow high accuracy measurements to be made by using a fixed base station and a second roving antenna, known as real-time kinematic surveying. Surveying techniques Surveyors determine the position of objects by measuring angles and distances, along with various factors that can affect the accuracy of their observations. From this information, they can calculate more advanced constructs such as vectors, bearings, coordinates, elevations, areas, volumes, plans and maps. Measurements are also often split into horizontal and vertical components to simplify calculation. GPS and astronomic measurements also require measurement of a time component. Historically, distances were measured using a variety of means, such as with chains having links of a known length, for instance a gunter's chain, or measuring tapes made of steel or in bar. To measure horizontal distances, these chains or tapes were pulled taut according to temperature, to reduce sagging and slack. Additionally, attempts to hold the measuring instrument level would be made. In instances of measuring up a slope, the surveyor might have to break the measurement using an increment less than the total length of the chain. Historically, horizontal angles were measured using a compass, which would provide a magnetic bearing, from which deflections could be measured. This type of instrument was later improved, with more carefully scribed disks providing better angular resolution, as well as through mounting telescopes with reticles for more precise sighting atop the disk. Additionally, levels and calibrated circles allowing measurement of vertical angles were added, along with verniers for measurement to a fraction of a degree euro such as with a turn-of-the-century transit. The simplest method for measuring height is with an altimeter a euro basically a barometer a euro using air pressure as an indication of height. But when more precise measurements are needed, a variety of means, such as precise levels, have been developed to do this. With precise leveling, a series of measurements between two points are taken using an instrument and a measuring rod. Differentials in height between the measurements are added and subtracted in a series to derive the net difference in elevation between the two end points of the series. With the advent of the global positioning system, elevation can also be derived with sophisticated satellite receivers, but usually with somewhat less accuracy than with traditional precise leveling. However, the accuracies may be similar if the traditional leveling would have to be run over a long distance. Turning is a term used when referring to moving the level to take an elevation shot in a different location. When land surveying, there may be trees or other obstructions blocking the view from the level gun to the level rod. In order to turn the level gun, one must first take a shot on the rod from the current location and record the elevation. Keeping the level rod in exactly the same location and elevation, one may move the level gun to a different location where the level rod is still visible. Record the new elevation seen from the new location of the level rod and use the difference in elevations to find the new elevation of the level gun. Turning is not only used when there are obstructions in the way, but also when drastically changing elevations. You can turn up or down in elevation but the gun must always be at a higher elevation than the base of the rod. A level rod can usually be raised up to 25 feet high, which enables the gun to be set much higher. However, if the gun is lower than the base of the rod, you will not be able to take a shot because the rod cannot be lowered beyond the ground elevation. Reference Networks Few survey positions are derived from first principles. Instead, most surveys' points are measured relative to previously measured points. This forms a reference or control network where each point can be used by a surveyor to determine their own position when beginning a new survey. Survey points are usually marked on the Earth's surface by an object ranging from small nails driven into the ground to large beacons that can be seen from long distances. The surveyor can set up their instruments on this position and measure to nearby objects. Sometimes a tall, distinctive feature such as a steeple or radio aerial has its position calculated a reference point that angles can be measured against. Triangulation is a method of horizontal location favored in the days prior to EDM and GPS measurement. With the triangulation method, distances, elevations and directions between objects at great distance from one another can be determined. Since the early days of surveying, this was the primary method of determining accurate positions of objects for topographic maps of large areas. 
a surveyor first needs to know the horizontal distance between two of the objects, known as the baseline. Then the height, distances and angular position of other objects can be derived, as long as they are visible from one of the original objects. High accuracy transits or theodolites were used for this work, and angles between objects were measured repeatedly for increased accuracy. See also triangulation in three dimensions. Offsetting is an alternate method of determining position of objects, and was often used to measure imprecise features such as river banks. The surveyor would mark and measure two known positions on the ground roughly parallel to the feature, and mark out a baseline between them. At regular intervals, a distance was measured at right angles from the first line to the feature. The measurements could then be plotted on a plan or map, and the points at the ends of the offset lines could be joined to show the feature. Traversing is a common method of surveying smaller areas. Starting from an old reference mark or known position, the surveyor creates a network of reference marks covering the area to be surveyed. They then measure bearings and distances between the reference marks, and to the features to be surveyed. Most traverses form a loop pattern or link between two prior reference marks to allow the surveyor to check their measurements are correct. Errors and accuracy A basic tenet of surveying is that no measurement is perfect, and that there will always be a small amount of error. Survey errors are classed into three types, gross errors or blunders, are errors made by the surveyor during the survey, for example, upsetting the instrument, misarming at a target, or writing down a measurement wrong. A large gross error may reduce the accuracy to an unacceptable level. Therefore surveyors use redundant measurements and independent checks to detect these errors early in the survey. Systematic errors, are errors that follow a consistent pattern. Examples include effects of temperature on a chain or EDM measurement, or a poorly adjusted spirit level resulting in a misaligned instrument or target pole. Systematic errors that have known effects can be compensated or corrected. Random errors. Random errors are the small unavoidable measurements caused by imperfections in measuring equipment, eyesight and conditions. They can be minimized by redundancy of measurement and avoiding unstable conditions. Random errors tend to cancel each other out, but checks must be made to ensure they are not propagating from one measurement to the next. Surveyors avoid propagating errors by ensuring that their equipment is in good condition, using consistent measurement and recording methods, and by good design of their survey reference network. Redundancy of measurements allows the use of averaging and allows outlier measurements to be discarded. Independent checks such as measuring a point from two or more locations or using two different methods means that errors can be detected by comparing the results of the two measurements. Surveying equipment. As late as the 1990s, the basic tools used in planar surveying were a tape measure for determining shorter distances, a level to determine height or elevation differences with a rod, and a theodolite, set on a tripod, to measure angles, combined with the process of triangulation. Starting from a position with known location and elevation, the distance and angles to the unknown point are measured. A more modern instrument is a total station which is a theodolite with an electronic distance measurement device. A total station can also be used for leveling when set to the horizontal plane. Since their introduction, total stations have made the technological shift from being optical mechanical devices to being fully electronic. Modern top-of-the-line total stations no longer require a reflector or prism to return the light pulses used for distance measurements. They are fully robotic, and can even email point data to a remote computer and connect to satellite positioning systems, such as Global Positioning System. Though real-time kinematic GPS systems have increased the speed and precision of surveying, they are still horizontally accurate to only about 20 m and vertically accurate to about 30 a euro 40 m. Total stations are still used widely, along with other types of surveying instruments, however, because GPS systems do not work well in areas with dense tree cover or constructions. One-person robotic guided total stations allow surveyors to gather precise measurements without extra workers to look through and turn the telescope or record data. A faster but expensive way to measure large areas is with a helicopter, equipped with a laser scanner, combined with a GPS to determine the position and elevation of the helicopter. 
To increase precision, surveyors place beacons on the ground apart. This method reaches precisions between 5 a Euro 40 a cm. As well as their primary measuring equipment, surveyors make use of ancillary equipment such as tripods and instrument stands, staves and beacons used for sighting purposes, PPE, vegetation clearing equipment, digging implements for finding survey markers that have been buried over time, hammers for placements of markers in various surfaces and structures, and portable radios for communication over long lines of sight. Types of surveys Specializations of surveying may be classed differently according to the local professional organization or regulatory body, but may be broadly grouped as follows. As built survey, a survey carried out during or immediately after a construction project for record, completion evaluation and payment purposes. An as-built survey is also known as a works as executed survey and documents the location of the recently constructed elements that are subject to completion evaluation. As-built surveys are often presented in red or read line and overlaid over existing design plans for direct comparison with design information. Cadastral or boundary surveying, a survey that establishes or re-establishes boundaries of a parcel using its legal description, which typically involves the setting or restoration of monuments or markers at the corners or along the lines of the parcel, often in the form of iron rods, pipes, or concrete monuments in the ground, or nails set in concrete or asphalt. A mortgage survey or physical survey is a simple survey that delineates land boundaries and building locations. In many places a mortgage survey is required by lending institutions as a precondition for a mortgage loan. The ALTAACSM Land Title Survey is a surveying standard jointly proposed by the American Land Title Association and the American Congress on Surveying and Mapping that incorporates elements of the Boundary Survey, Mortgage Survey, and Topographic Survey. Compass and Tape Survey, perhaps the simplest type, Control Surveying, Control surveys establish reference points that surveyors can use to establish their own position at the start of future surveys. Most other forms of surveying will contain elements of control surveying. Deformation survey, a survey to determine if a structure or object is changing shape or moving. The three-dimensional positions of specific points on an object are determined, a period of time is allowed to pass, these positions are then re-measured and calculated, and a comparison between the two sets of positions is made. Dimensional control survey. This is a type of survey conducted in ore on a non-level surface. Commonly used in the oil and gas industry to replace old or damaged pipes on a like-for-like -like basis, the advantage of dimensional control survey is that the instrument used to conduct the survey does not need to be level. This is advantageous in the offshore industry, as not all platforms are fixed and are thus subject to movement. Engineering surveying those surveys associated with the engineering design often requiring geodetic computations beyond normal civil engineering practice. Foundation survey, a survey done to collect the positional data on a foundation that has been poured and is cured. This is done to ensure that the foundation was constructed in the location, and at the elevation, authorized in the plot plan, site plan, or subdivision plan. Hydrographic survey. A survey conducted with the purpose of mapping the shoreline and bed of a body of water for navigation, engineering, or resource management purposes. Leveling, either finds the elevation of a given point or establish a point at a given elevation. Measured surveyor a building survey to produce plans of the building. Such a survey may be conducted before renovation works, for commercial purpose, or at end of the construction process. Photographic control survey. A survey that creates reference marks clearly visible from the air to allow aerial photographs to be rectified. Stakeout, layout or setout, an element of many other surveys where the calculated or proposed position of an object is marked on the ground either temporarily or permanently. This is an important component of engineering and cadastral surveying. Structural survey, a detailed inspection to report upon the physical condition and structural stability of a building or other structure and to highlight any work needed to maintain it in good repair. Tape survey, this type of survey is the most basic and inexpensive type of land survey. Popular in the middle part of the 20th century, 
Tape surveys while being accurate for distance lack substantially in their accuracy of measuring angle and bearing standards that are practiced by professional land surveyors. Topographic survey, a survey that measures the elevation of points on a particular piece of land, and presents them as contour lines on a plot. Surveying as a career. The basic principles of surveying have changed little over the ages, but the tools used by surveyors have evolved tremendously. Engineering especially civil engineering, depends heavily on surveyors. Whenever there are roads, railways, reservoir, dams, pipeline transports retaining walls, bridges or residential areas to be built, surveyors are involved. They establish the boundaries of legal descriptions and the boundaries of various lines of political divisions. They also provide advice and data for geographical information systems computer databases that contain data on land features and boundaries. Surveyors must have a thorough knowledge of algebra, basic calculus, geometry, and trigonometry. They must also know the laws that deal with surveys, property, and contracts. In addition, they must be able to use delicate instruments with accuracy and precision. In the United States, Surveyors and civil engineers use units of feet wherein a survey foot is broken down into 10 ths and 100 ths. Many deed descriptions requiring distance calls are often expressed using these units. On the subject of accuracy, surveyors are often held to a standard of 1 one hundredth of a foot. About 1 eighth an inch. Calculation and mapping tolerances are much smaller wherein achieving near perfect closures are desired. Though tolerances such as this will vary from project to project, in the field and day-to-day -day usage beyond a one hundredth of a foot is often impractical. Licensing Licensing requirements vary with jurisdiction, and are commonly consistent within national borders. USA In most of the United States, surveying is recognized as a distinct profession apart from engineering. Licensing requirements vary by state, but they generally have components of education, experience and examinations. In the past, experience gained through an apprenticeship, together with passing a series of state-administered examinations, was required to attain licensure. Now, most states insist upon basic qualification of a degree in surveying, plus experience and examination requirements. The licensing process typically follows two phases. First, upon graduation, the candidate may be eligible to take the fundamentals of surveying exam, to be certified upon passing and meeting all other requirements as a surveying intern, formerly surveyor in training. Upon being certified as an SI, the candidate then needs to gain additional experience to become eligible for the second phase. That typically consists of the principles and practice of land surveying exam along with a state-specific examination. Licensed surveyors usually denote themselves with the letters PLS, PS, LS, RLS, RPLS, or PSM following their names, depending upon the dictates of their particular jurisdiction of registration. Canada In Canada, land surveyors are registered to work in their respective province. The designation for a land surveyor breaks down by province, but follows the rule whereby the first letter indicates the province, followed by LS. There is also a designation as a CLS, or Canada Lands Surveyor, who has the authority to work on Canada lands, which include Indian reserves, national parks, the three territories and offshore lands. Commonwealth In many Commonwealth countries, the term chartered land surveyor is used for someone holding a professional license to conduct surveys. Legal Aspects A licensed land surveyor is typically required to sign and seal all plans, the format of which is dictated by their state jurisdiction, which shows their name and registration number. In many states, when setting boundary corners land surveyors are also required to place survey monuments bearing their registration numbers, typically in the form of capped iron rods, concrete monuments, or nails with washers. Building surveying In the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom and most Commonwealth countries building surveying is considered to be a distinct profession. Land surveyors have their own professional associations and licensing requirements. The services of a licensed land surveyor are generally required for boundary surveys and subdivision plans. Duties and roles, 
one of the primary roles of the land surveyor is to determine the boundary of real property on the ground. That boundary has already been established and described in legal documents and official plans and maps prepared by attorneys, engineers, and other land surveyors. The corners of the property will either have been monumented by a prior surveyor, or monumented by the surveyor hired to perform a survey of a new boundary which has been agreed upon by adjoining landowners. Monuments are categorized into two groups which are known as natural and artificial. Natural monuments are things such as trees, large stones and other substantial, naturally occurring objects that were in place before the survey was made. An artificial monument is anything within the regulations that are usually placed at corner points by landowners, surveyors, engineers and others. They may be referred to as iron pins or pipes, stakes, trees, concrete monuments or whatever the surveyor decides to use at the time, within the regulations for the area. The courts have held that natural monuments control over artificial monuments because they are more certain in identification and less likely to be disturbed. Over time, construction and maintenance of roads and many other acts of man, along with acts of nature such as earthquakes, movement of water, and tectonic shift can obliterate or damage the monumented locations of land boundaries. The land surveyor is often compelled to consider other evidence such as fence locations, wood lines, monuments on neighboring properties and recollections of people. This other evidence is known as extrinsic evidence and is a fairly common principle. Extrinsic evidence is defined as evidence outside the writings, in this case the deed. Extrinsic evidence is held to be synonymous with evidence from another source. Today's land surveyor sets monumentation at actual physical points on the ground that define angle points of boundary lines that divide neighboring parcels. These monuments are most often one-half, or five-slash-eight iron rebar rods or pipes placed at 18 minimum depth, but varies state by state. The more recent rods or pipes may have an affixed plastic cap over the top bearing the responsible surveyor's name and license number. Older monuments may exist such as old pipes, gun barrels, axles, mounds of stone, whiskey bottles, or even wooden stakes. In addition to rods and pipes, surveyors might use 4x4 concrete posts at corners of large parcels or anywhere that would require more stability. They place them three feet deep. In places where there is asphalt or concrete, it is common to place nails or aluminum alloy caps to re-establish boundary corners. Marks are meant to be durable, stable, and as permanent as possible. The aim is to provide sufficient marks so some marks will remain for future re-establishment of boundaries. The material and marking used on monuments placed to mark boundary corners are often subject to state laws. Many states have laws that protect existing monuments and can have civil penalties if disturbed or destroyed. Cadastral land surveyors are licensed by governments. In the United States, cadastral surveys are typically conducted by the federal government, specifically through the Cadastral Surveys branch of the Bureau of Land Management, formerly the General Land Office. They consult with USFS, Park Service, Corps of Engineers, BIA, Fish and Wildlife Service, Bureau of Reclamation, etc. In states that have been organized per the Public Land Survey System, surveyors carry out BLM cadastral surveys in accordance with that system. A common use of a survey is to determine a legal property boundary. The first stage in such a survey, known as a reserve, is to obtain copies of the deed description and all other available documents from the owner. The deed description is that of the deed and not a tax statement or other incomplete document. The surveyor should then obtain copies of deed descriptions and maps of the adjoining properties, any records from the municipality or county, utility maps and any records of surveys. Depending on which region the survey is located in some or most of this information may not be available or even exist. Whether the information exists or not a thorough search should be conducted so that no records are neglected. Copies of deeds usually can be located in the county recorder's office and maps or plats can usually be found at the county recorder or surveyor's office. These arrangements will vary state to state and survey system to survey system so some familiarity may be needed. When all the records are assembled, the surveyor examines the documents for errors, such as closure errors. 
when a meets and bounds description is involved, the seniority of the deeds must be determined. The title abstract usually gives the order of seniority for the deeds related to the tract being surveyed and should be used if available. After this data is gathered and analyzed the field survey may commence. The initial survey operations should be concentrated on locating monuments. In urban regions or a city, monuments should be sought initially but in the absence of monuments property corners marked by iron pins, metal survey markers, iron pipes and other features that may establish a line of possession should be located. When the approximate positions for the boundaries of the property have been located a traverse is run around the property. While the controlled traverse is being run, ties should be measured and all details relevant to the boundaries should be acquired. This includes but is not limited to locating the property corners, monuments, fences, hedge rows, walls, walks and all buildings on the lot. The surveyor then takes this data collected and compares it to the records that were received. When a solution is reached the property corners that are chosen as those that best fit all the data are coordinated and ties by direction and distance are computed from the nearest traverse point. Once this has been established the features on the lot can be drawn, dimensions can be shown from these features to the boundary line and a map or plat is prepared for the client. The Art of Land Surveying Many properties have considerable problems with regards to improper bounding, miscalculations in past surveys, titles, easements, and wildlife crossings. Also many properties are created from multiple divisions of a larger piece over the course of years, and with every additional division the risk of miscalculation increases. The result can be abutting properties not coinciding with adjacent parcels, resulting in hiatuses and overlaps. Many times a surveyor must solve a puzzle using pieces that do not exactly fit together. In these cases, the solution is based upon the surveyor's research and interpretation, along with established procedures for resolving discrepancies. This essentially is a process of continual error correction and update, where official recordation documents countermand the previous and sometime erroneous survey documents recorded by older monuments and older survey methods. See also Cartography, References Further reading External links, Gar Copyright Oma to Sans Franchise Association de Gar Copyright Amitas Pour Aid or Gar Copyright Vilopement. And Geo Surveyors Without Borders, the National Museum of Surveying the home of the National Museum of Surveying in Springfield, Illinois, Land Surveyors United Support Network Global Social Support Network featuring surveyor forums, instructional videos industry news and support groups based on geolocation. Natural Resources Canada Euro Surveying Good Overview of Surveying with References to Construction Surveys, Cadastral Surveys, Photogrammetry Surveys, Mining Surveys, Hydrographic Surveys, Route Surveys, Control Surveys and Topographic Surveys, as built a Euro Problems and Proposed Solutions a Euro Discussion on Building Surveys within Construction Industry by Stephen Apatee, CCM, Table of Surveying, 1728 Cyclopedia, Google Map with Overlays for Principal Meridians, Coordinate Zones, NGS Control, USGS Topographic Maps and more, Surveying and Triangulation The History of Surveying and Survey Equipment, Basic Programs for Surveying and Mapping, NCES National Council of Examiners for Engineering and Surveying, International Federation of Surveyors International Federation of Surveyors, RICS certified RICS certified surveyors in Middle East and North Africa, Land Sterling.